Well, he had just given a marvelous performance, the symphony concerto. I mean, it was, it was wonderful to hear a big pianist, an important pianist, with all kinds of technique and all kinds of musical perception, playing this piece and kind of getting into its corners. And Sonia was in seventh heaven. I mean, how often does a composer hear her work really beautifully done? He had just done it beautifully, so she was thrilled. And uh, but then she had this big reception, and she had all these guests, and um, and it may have been Bernard Noonan, the party, who's such a quiet man, but such a kind of a nice, logical man, uh, who may have got into a kind of argument with uh, with uh, Corti, putting him on the spot about some of the things that Stalin had done and all this kind of thing, and Corti was wriggling out from under this because he. He, he, st- he was arguing on principle, and uh, Bernard Newman was trying to bring up some of the facts that were uncomfortable. So they got quite contentious. And, uh, Bernard Newman was, he Bernard. was a professor? Yes, he was a mathematics professor okay, at the okay. University of Bernard Manhattan. and Nancy Newman. Bernard and Nancy Newman. And their Newman. son is Philip. I guess yeah, so, yes. Philip Newman. And uh, they were marvelous people. I loved them. Nancy was a pianist, and she had a stammer, and she a uh, big stout woman, but very sweet, very nice woman. And Bernard was a, was a sweet man. But uh, there they were. And uh, so, as I say, things got quite hot and quite uh, people lining up on both sides, you see. And um, all of a sudden, Sonia brought it to a shuddering halt. <laughs> she stamped her foot and banged her hand down on the table, and she said, All I know is there has been too much time. Everything was over. The argument was over. She, you know, everybody was to blame as far as she was concerned. There had been too much given. But it was a, um, it was a wonderful evening. And it, as a, one of those, you all, you never went to the Eckhart's and came away with an empty head. There was always, you all had always seen something you weren't used to seeing, heard something you weren't used to hearing. Interacted with people. Interacting with people. It was a, a real old-fashioned kind of intellectual evening in a funny way, with everybody, with no holds barred and everybody speaking freely and, and moved to speak freely. I mean, stimulated to speak freely. So I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed them very much. Mm-hmm. So you have a very fond memories of 54 Harrow. So oh, yeah. yeah. I never forget the address. I can pick it out at any time. And, you know, I can forget my own name. <laughs> I, I, don't have a, I don't have a clear memory <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but um, I never forget that address, 54 Harrow. It's, uh, yeah, embedded. It's a fixed point in the musical history of Winnipeg. And there was nothing like it, nothing else like it there. It was, uh, it was an address. It was a, a hub. It was a place where, where uh, the arts happened in a funny way. Uh, and, uh, mm-hmm. it's just like the, the address of my own teacher, Nadia Boulanger, 36 Rue Valu. It's in my mind forever, you know. When, uh, when did you study with her? 1959-60. I took it. I took a year off. Uh, from, I was at that time the music critic of the uh, Winnipeg Free Press, and I figured that I'd, I'd been doing it since 1954, and I figured I'd just about reached the end of the contents of my mind, and I thought I had to do something about it. I didn't. You always, you know, in a funny way, but it was just a feeling I had that I had to somehow refresh myself and learn something more, and, and uh, so I finagled and somehow managed to get a year in Paris and wow. uh, and she was she was wonderful I mean it was, why she accepted me I'll never know I had very little formal education in the writing of music I, I wanted to study composition with her. Mm-hmm. and I had composed but I had composed as a complete amateur I wasn't a I knew how to write notes I was a music student I, I was a pianist and a singer and I, mm-hmm. I was familiar with all that and I'd taken theory for my exams, but that was it. And I was trying to write music, and I was writing it, um, but uh, I felt that I needed 
I needed somehow or other a real perspective on the thing. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so I sent her a couple of my compositions. I'm sure she must have laughed at them. But she, it's very sweetly, she wrote back and said that she would expect me on September the 15th, whatever it was, at 36 Rue Ballou. And I thought, oh my God, I've got to go now. I'm, I've been accepted. <laughs> so I hastily tried to gather together enough money to do it. And, and I got just enough to go over. And uh, I applied to the Canada Council, and they said no. They gave me nothing. Uh, and then they finally reneged a little bit, or relented a little bit later on, and said that they would, they would stake me to the uh, ocean voyage, the uh, trip across the Atlantic both ways. So they gave me a little grant to cover that. But they didn't uh, do anything about paying for my lessons or, or providing me with any kind of living allowance while I was there. I had to raise that myself. Well, I did. And uh, I, I made an arrangement with the Winnipeg Free Press that I would send them, three, get this, three pieces a week for $100 a month from Paris. Well, I mean, $100 was more in 1959 than it is now. But it was still pretty pretty skimpy, and they got a huge bargain for that. No kidding. But uh, on the basis of that, I got a green card so that I could go to concerts in Paris without having to pay. I, I got a, it. It was a, not a green card. It was a blue card, I think. But it was. Uh, it said that I was a music critic for an accredited newspaper in Canada, and I could turn this in at the uh, at the ticket desk at most concerts and get in. Uh, getting into the opera was more complicated. I had to go and visit the intendant of the opera, or the, uh, the manager of the opera, and I had to take a couple of cartons of cigarettes and pass them to him without anything being said. <laughs> but I got there. I, I, it was a wonderful year. But you know, uh, Nadia Boulanger was, wasn't like Sonia in that, in, I mean she was an entirely different person, but she was that kind and size of musician. It was the same when you talk to Nadia or you talk to Sonia, you were talking to somebody to whom music was their very essence and their very language, and they knew how to speak in it and what to say in it and the whole thing, and they were, they, you felt that you were talking to people who were in touch with all of their art. And uh, there are very few people like that. You know, most people, most people, when they, they can look at a score and they can reproduce the notes on the piano, but they can't look at a score and hear the notes in here, between their ears. They can't do that. Most people can't. Even, even professional musicians can. Lots of conductors can't. Lots of conductors can do the, can give you the traffic signs, you know, the stops and the starts. They know how to negotiate their way through the score, but they can't look at it and hear it. Nadia could, I believe Sonia could. You know, the, the notes were real, and it. There are very few people in this world to whom that is so. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna. Let's go. Um, where do you see uh, Sonia's place in the history of? of uh, Canadian music or Canadian composers now that some some time has passed since her death? It's a very tough question because Sonia was never of Canadian music. She was a European in Canada. And her music is music of a certain era, an era which is which represents a kind of softening after Schoenberg. It has elements of Schoenberg, elements of the European avant-garde of those years, but it's um, not as not as austere, not as rigorous. Um, there's more willful play of the personality in it. So, as far as it being a place in Canadian music, in the sense part of Canadian music. It always seems to me to be a bit of an outsider. On the other hand, we have works of hers like the Manitoba Symphony, which was inspired by her life in Manitoba. We have uh, her influence in Manitoba as a teacher and as a as a performer of t of of, uh, of a teacher of as a teacher of performance. 
which was uh, important. And the music itself, I think, is important just as music. I don't see it as being in a kind of line of development of Canadian music at all. I see it being aside from that, but still very much there. I think it has its own place, its own niche. And because Canada is not is not a single race like the European countries. I mean, we're not all French, we're not all English, we're not all Ukrainian, we're not all German. Uh, there is a place, because Sonia came to us as, well, who knows what? I mean, she, her, her mother was, uh, I think, taught French to the, to the Russian family of the Tolstoys, and Sonia may very well be the result of a, a little fling with this nice young French teacher and old Tolstoy himself, who knows, dirty old man. Anyway, she might be Tolstoy's daughter, which might explain a lot of things. <laughs> but you know, uh, and, and she was trained in Germany, so I mean, what is Sonia? She's an internationalist in a way. But, um, but she is, to me, such a vital person, and her music is so vigorous of its kind that uh, I think it always will have a place, and I hope it will have more and more of a place as people get to know it and understand it and enjoy it. it, it like any, anything that's worth doing or worth knowing, it takes a bit of time, a bit of effort. You can't just, just hear it and love it necessarily. Although I, I have to say I've never had any difficulty with it, apart from the, from the rather discursive quality that I always teased her about and criticized her for, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that she fought right back about. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's good music. I think it's good. I think it's it's real music and good music, and I think it has its place. But I think it will not be in the in the sort of main line of Canadian quote Canadian music. Um, to me, she remains far too much a European for that. Um, which, which kind of leads me then to, to one of my last questions, which is, um, what, what do you think might have been her career and her legacy had they not come to Canada in terms of her, her musical contribution? That's also a very tough question. If she'd stayed in Europe, I think it would have been harder for her in the end. Really? That's my guess. Mm. Um, although in the present era there are important woman composers in Europe, Gubadulina, people like that. But um, I think she had a fairer shake coming to Canada in a funny way. And I think also that Canada provided her with certain kinds of inspiration that she would not have had otherwise. I think that, I think that though Canada was hard for her, and she was hard for Canada. I think, nevertheless, there, there developed a symbiosis which grew out of a kind of mutual stimulation. <laughs> I think Canada and Sonia stirred each other up. And I think it was good for them both. Um, I'm awfully glad she came. I think we'd have been way poorer without her. But that's a very interesting comment because you you do certainly uh, I mean as as anyone who hears the story or has met mm -hmm. them you know the the the, the um, you know very cosmopolitan highly cultured couple that they were coming to Winnipeg is is a complete you know anomaly mm -hmm. you know it's it's mm -hmm. like how did this happen mm -hmm. like. Yeah, go figure. Uh, go figure. And, and um, you know, it, it is. I in, and to have been there as well. I mean, I, in your description and in other descriptions I've heard of it, I can just visualize it. Uh, yeah, having lived in Winnipeg, you know, for yep. for uh, a little while myself. Uh, on the other hand, as um, you know, as much of a d dichotomy as it seems that you know this juxtaposition of her and the prairies, uh, like you say, uh, it may not have. It may have been of benefit to her in in the long run in terms of her inspiration. I think it or, opened her out in some ways. Yeah. Then, then if she had stayed in Europe, where she was just starting to to be on paper more accepted in Vienna, you know, she was starting to have you know win some awards, you know, find a certain acceptance. But in you know in the long haul, that that um, that I've, may not have continued. 
I know, think or, that's or, true, and I think she would have become more doctrinaire yeah. in Europe. Yeah. I think she'd have got chan channeled into a into a into a, a narrower mold. mold. Whereas coming here, where everything was wide open and everything had to be reinvented almost from the ground up, I think it I think it had a wonderful effect on her, and I think that um, as I say, I think she had a wonderful effect on us, and I think. The other thing is that I think I think of somebody like Chester Duncan in Winnipeg, who is who has uh, been in Winnipeg forever and who has never uh, who has contented himself to be in Winnipeg, and uh, who is yet a highly intelligent, articulate musician and mind, and he became quite interested in Eckhart and in Sonia and and performed some of her works and uh, spoke about her and she was always you always felt that she was a bit of a thorn in Chester's flesh in the sense that he's a composer and he saw this person coming in from outside this big talent and this big person and it must have shaken him in a way and yet with his intelligence he gradually took in this person and be, be and came to admire her very much well you see there's action going both ways there and uh, I think she was a wonderfully fertile uh, influence. However, however, the sort of Anglo-Saxon stiff-neckedness uh, may have resisted her, I think that that same Anglo-Saxon stiff-neckedness and fiber gradually recognized her and, and in a way took her in and became fond of her and glad to have her. I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a process, and it was may have, maybe a slow process. It must have seemed to her intolerably slow at times. But I think they did. And you know, somebody like Lauren Watson, who is uh, not what you'd call a, a bizarre or extravagant or eccentric musician, he, he's, he's trained in the proper channels and all that sort of thing, but he took her. He took her in because he was bright enough, and able to to see, and able to learn from her. And uh, I think that many Peggy Sampson. Of course, Peggy came from from Great Britain, and so she was. She had a, a bigger sophistication, perhaps, than many in, in many of the musical establishment in Winnipeg. But uh, you know, she commissioned a work from Sonia, and. Uh, was very interesting. It took some lessons in the cello from Sonia because Sonia's ideas on technique could apply. And uh, she recognized there was something there that you couldn't just lay your hand on anyplace else. So that I think that um, I think on the whole it was a, a good thing and good for Sonia too. This has been an interview with Ken Winters in Pickering, Ontario, June 10th, 1999, at the uh, Coffee Time <laughs> Coffee Time Donuts, close to the GO station. Signing off. Uh -huh. um, Sonia had just been uh, had just had her great triumph playing both her piano concerto and her violin concerto with. Uh, Leopold Stokowski right. in the United States, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh, she uh, had arrived back in Vienna, and uh, she was very full of herself. She said, "There I was, just back from from uh, America, very smart with the hat," and she said, "And there is somebody at my door," and I opened my door, and there is this young man. He is not interested in me. He is not interested in the hat. He is just going with his long legs all around the apartment. He was interested in the graphic of Gramate. And uh, apparently she... With his long legs. With his long legs. <laughs> and so you can just see it, you know. Well, and in comparison to her, In right? comparison to her, yeah, she was I so mean, tiny. Yeah, like everything. And I can just see her with her hat on from America, sitting there in the apartment with her hat on. <laughs> 
<laughs> waiting to receive this this young uh, this young curator from the museum. <coughs> but uh, obviously, uh, he was a little more interested in her and in the hat that he indicated because <laughs> it was soon. It was the beginning. It was the beginning of uh, of their relationship. But she was so funny telling it. Oh, I mean, nobody could tell it like her. Her voice was so fabulous. She had this husky, yes. husky, uh, impatient voice. With uh, uh, I used to say that it sort of went from clarinet to bassoon uh, because she had these these low kind of rough sounds in it, as well as uh, quite plaintive, quite. Uh, yeah, I've heard her her voice um, in that uh, radio documentary. Of course. That, that uh, and then also um, that um, well, the footage from that documentary, some of the footage of her speaking, was taken um, from prior doc uh, things that CBC had done, but also from a video tape of a master class that she gave at Brandon University. I've seen that video right. tape. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's so fun. And and I mean that's you know really I think that's the only video footage. That, yeah. that exists of Sonia, I, I mean, that, that to the knowledge of the foundation. And it's so interesting, to never having met her. Oh, to, yeah, to of at least, you won't. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, that's that's the only you know, live visual, really. But it's very, that, the thing about it is... And, and I mean, but her voice is so unique. Oh, it is. Uh, oh, that's, there isn't another like it. No. And, and uh, that particular video captures, I think, wonderfully. She's a little self-conscious, that's true, but it's her. It's, she's all there, and uh, her way of moving, the, the way she carried herself, the way she used her hands, it's, it's a very nice, uh, succinct little thing in a way, mm -hmm. to represent her. Kind of a nutshell. Kind of yeah, it's a nutshell. A capsule, yeah. It is. It's too bad there, there aren't some more, though, because she was uh, a huge communicator. And this is one of the things that uh, she takes it almost for granted. Um, but all her music and her play and her techniques are all communications in a very positive way. It's not, her art is not really an abstract art at all. It's enormously uh, uh, confrontational, presentational kind of art. Uh, and she, she wanted it to be that way. She, she always talked about the virtuosity of her composition. She wanted it to sound virtuosic. She wanted it to to um, hit you between the eyes. She wanted it to make its effect. And she wanted it to be received. And when it wasn't received, <laughs> she would she was positively angry. She, mm -hmm. she, she, she had an absolute compulsion to communicate. And this is uh, this is what I think is wonderful about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 